for coming everyone, uh, it's great to see you. Um, uh, my name is Dr Sarah Cole, orthopaedic surgeon based in Cairns in far north Queensland. Uh, and this is our monthly uh, Allied Health GP talk. Um, and tonight it is my great pleasure to talk about pain again. Uh, we're going in a little bit more depth compared to our last um, uh, talk last year. And um, I think I'll get you to introduce yourself. Tell us um, what you do in Cairns and tell us about your team. Yeah, so I'm an exercise physiologist. I graduated from Cairnsman JCU and my area is pain. I love working with people in pain. And my team, they work across the lifespan. We have a team that love working in pain. So psych, OT, physio, sitting right here. And, but the rest of our team in that, those same disciplines are across the lifespan and range of disabilities and disease and health concerns. Cool. All right. Well, tell us all about it. Take it away. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me, and thank you for your attention, everybody. And feel free to eat, and if you have any questions <laughs> at any point, feel free to let me know. Uh, so, first of all, I'd like to pay my respects to the Yudinji people on whose land we meet today, and pay my respects to their strength, their resilience, and their culture. And I've already introduced myself, so I can fly through these slides. And, but I basically started in private practice as a new grad and I kind of remember coming across people with now what I understand to be chronic pain and factors contributing to that and I didn't really have much idea what to do. I ended up experiencing injury and having chronic pain, seeing multiple health professionals in Cairns and not really getting a lot of recovery from it and that then led me down the path of explained pain, which I'm sure you've all heard of that book and YouTube videos of Lauren Mosley, Noi courses, and then my Masters of Science in Medicine Pain Management in 2022, and started FNQ Rehab, which is our, the, the clinic that I run now, that's now rebranded to Thriving Lives Co. And then at the start of last year, did like an education component for pain education, because as we know, the things we learn we don't always learn how to teach, so helpful to be able to put that into ways that's a little bit easier to convey to patients. And I'm currently the Pain Revolution uh, Local Pain Educator with Bonnie Bryan, so our role in Cairns is to help upskill local health professionals in pain science. And this is our clinic, so if you've seen FNQ Chronic Pain and Disease Rehab, we've rebranded, so that's, that's where we've come from. So as Sarah mentioned, this is kind of a follow on from last year. So if there's any questions you have about any of the information, I'm gonna kind of skip over some of the things that we've already spoken about, but a quick recap, we went through pain theories, the definition of pain, pain modulation process, the power of context in pain, crucial aspects of high quality pain care, value of imaging, impact of language on pain and common pain related behaviors, graded exposure, protectometer, and key learning statements for pain. So if any of the things about that come up, feel free to ask, but I'm skipping over most of that stuff today. What we will cover today will be the burden of persistent pain, some of the problems in pain management that we currently face, what's involved in the transition from acute to chronic pain, the types of pain, brief recap, make it a little bit easier, and some of the neurobiology of persistent pain as well and some strategies to improve how you can. So hopefully you leave today with something you can put into the clinic. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna quickly go through the, the statistics, but we know it's a big problem, as you can see. It gets worse and worse as we age. We're not sure what the relationship is there. There's lots of factors, but it's becoming a really big problem. So much so that this is the allocated health system costs for chronic pain as of 2018. Injury and musculoskeletal are like two and a half billion combined, which is almost half of the entire burden of chronic pain. So as orthopedic specialists, physios, OTs, this is mostly the presentations that we come across, so that's mostly what I'm gonna talk about today. So in terms of disability burden, so it's huge. So 20% of entire disability burden within Australia is due to just musculoskeletal conditions on their own, which is pretty staggering worse in females and older Australians. And this is the graphical representation of it up here. So the cream over there is back pain and other MSK conditions. 
And then these are all other health concerns that somebody could have. And MSK is such a big proportion of that. This is just a breakdown more specifically, so OA and RA. So I imagine this is a lot of what you guys are seeing in the presentations people have made, chronically anyway. So we know there's also huge engagement with GPs. So median of seven appointments with GPs as opposed to four for any other reason. And <clears throat> MSK disorders account for 14 to 17% of primary care consultations as well. So even if GPs don't really thoroughly enjoy working with people with chronic pain from MSK conditions or it's not their kind of circle of confidence, they're gonna be seeing it a lot, unfortunately. It's also getting worse. So in 1990, mental disorders were the biggest problem above musculoskeletal. Now musculoskeletal disorders has overtaken it. And there's also considerations of how often does MSK lead to secondary mental disorders as well. So even the prevalence of mental illness could be getting worse because of MSK. It's also bi-directional, we know that. So pain can lead to more mental health concerns and mental health can contribute to pain, but less so. So we know there's massive gaps, you know, use of imaging, inappropriate referral to specialist care, non-indicated surgery and opioid prescription as well. <laughs> non-indicated and inappropriate. <laughs> there's a place for everybody. <laughs> And I actually didn't have the word inappropriate because that wasn't in the literature. And I, as I read it, I went, hmm, inappropriate. It's more appropriate right there. <laughs> so put your hands up if you've seen this before. No. So these are the guidelines for MSK high quality pain care. So they came out about five years ago from a systematic review of all of the literature around evidence-based care for MSK. So it basically outlines all the things that haven't been getting done in Australia in MSK. So big problem is we're, we're clearly not following these guidelines very well. Uh, in terms of the risk factors associated with transition, this is specific to lower back pain. But what they found is that if you're exposed to non-concordant processes of care within the first 21 days, you're more likely to have chronic pain in six months. So those figures are if you've got three, you're 2.16 times more likely to have chronic pain. Now those processes of care are things like non-recommended medications, radiography or CT MRI orders, so imaging that's not necessarily indicated, or specialist referrals, inappropriate specialist referrals. <laughs> and some of the patient and clinical characteristics was obesity, smoking, severe and very severe, baseline disability and diagnosed depression and anxiety. I can't imagine any of this as a shock to all of you. So the trends in imaging, we know that 2% of lower back pain is generally significant pathology, yet three out of 10 people are getting scans for it. So it's still a bit of a problem and <clears throat> big prevalence across MSK conditions. So it's not just lower back pain, it's shoulders, knees, hips, everywhere. We're doing a lot more imaging than the significant pathology that's being presented as well. So it's it's potentially due to admirable efforts to do less harm. You know, there's a whole lot less radiation, none in MRI compared to X-ray and CT. However, the the harm of this excess imaging is that over detection, over treatment, and all the flow on effects from that, as well as financial and looking after the climate, we've only got one planet. So these are some of the harms that come from this trend in imaging. Opioids, we're actually getting a lot better, which is good. It's still not ideal, so it's still 9.5% of people with MSK conditions are prescribed opioids. And it's worse in rural Australia, lower SES, and worse in females. But if you have a look at this graph, so white is new opioids, grey is previously started, our proportion's getting better. So a lot of the prevalence now is more so because people have been started on it historically as well. And we're also getting better at they're not taking opioids for as long. So that's a, that's a positive for us Australian health professionals. So pharmacological management rates of foot ankle OA are really high in terms of medication as opposed to referral to allied health and just simple lifestyle advice that could potentially do what the intended effect is of that medication as well. And referrals to orthopedic surgeons and opioid scripts are similar to allied health. 
which, you know, when we think about the transition of care, ordinarily we wouldn't necessarily send someone to a specialist straight away or put them onto opioids. We'd like to think that generally they're being able to see a more conservative approach, but that's not what we're finding in, in the statistics. And big problem, kind of what Lisa alluded to earlier before this all started, that sometimes imaging can highlight abnormalities in imaging, postural or just incidental findings as well. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with that, but here are some of the common examples that you'd see all the time. And this doesn't mean that people that have these imaging findings don't have clear nociceptive kind of associations with pain, but a lot of the time, this isn't the case, and this is quite an incidental and asymptomatic finding as well. So the problems of this over-detection is we tend to do a lot of over-treatment. So a lot of miss and disinformation related to particular interventions that aren't orthopaedic surgery related, more other professions are to blame like EPs and physios like acupuncture, manual therapy, injections, pharmacotherapy and trigger point. Now that's not to say that there isn't a place for these, there's a place for all interventions that are going to help that person in their recovery and it's a bit of a nuanced topic but the problem is that it's being overutilised and the narrative sometimes that's delivered with it isn't overly helpful. And then orthopaedic surgery. So there's some orthopaedic surgeries that are occurring when they aren't necessarily indicated as well. And here's a list of some of the commonly done ones. So main consequences of this kind of non-concordant process of care. The biggest one that you probably all face is that the beliefs they then have that something needs to be fixed or what's found in the imaging is then what needs to be treated. And symptoms are caused by abnormalities in posture and that type of thing. So these are just some examples of the beliefs that they then hold and kind of other dot points are more related to particular things that these beliefs are then worsened in. Some good news though, even though it's becoming a bigger problem in Australia, MSK pain and conditions, People are really interested in learning about it. So they're Googling it a lot more, and these particular conditions are the ones that they're Googling more. Anyone have an idea of kind of the relevance of those particular conditions that they're Googling? It's fantastic that they're Googling gout. What are they doing? Are they wanting to know if they've got it or do they want to know how to treat it? Great question. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> what they're finding is they're not as interested in treatments anymore, which is really exciting considering the amount of things that come across their Instagram about the different ways to fix everything. But they are really interested in what's causing it. So really exciting because a lot of the times that's what we really want to help them understand. You know, and it makes sense. A lot of the things that they expect when they come in to see us is what's wrong with me? What do I need to do? What are you going to do? And how long is this going to take? You know, that's more so physiotherapists based on the research is what people want to know, but they want to know what the cause of symptoms. So, very exciting from our perspective because it's been this really challenging thing to talk to people about what is causing their symptoms when it becomes a little bit less related to structural pathology, but they're Googling it now and so they're really interested in the cause. So we have to be able to give them clarity on what is the cause and that's where it gets a little bit harder because it is really confusing in these MSK conditions where nociceptive contributors are getting less and less. So examples being RA patients, so research is finding that even when they have low inflammatory markers, they're reporting high levels of pain. And in lower back pain, we know that there's rarely a nociceptive cause identified. And in osteoarthritis, sensitization is becoming more and more of a problem. So if they're Googling it and finding this information, is this going to be answering their questions? Probably not. So then they're going to come to us, or hopefully they're going to come to us, and then we can give them the answers. Hopefully I can give you some of those answers today. So what is the cause? So they're finding that central sensitization and nociplastic features are predominantly showing up for these particular conditions. So what's the relevance of these conditions based on the epidemiology from before? The most prevalent. Yeah, that's what's showing up a lot which is probably what's making sense as to why they're not recovering very well as well. So they're all captured and represented really clearly here. The only one that's not a main one is fibromyalgia, which is 
falls under other MS county. So how can we explain the cause to our patients when there's things like central sensitization and it's becoming more nociplastic? So this was a, a phrase coined by Lorimer Mosley and his group, pain system hypersensitivity. So it's essentially to communicate that their pain system is becoming overprotective. Now, have you guys had much experience in telling patients or helping patients understand what central sensitization is or nociplastic pain? And what's been your experience in their reception to it or comprehension of it? It depending on how ready they are to, yep. to hear it too. Yeah. Any other experiences? Yes. Yeah, very I feel some people have good buy-in, some people are resistive. Yeah. And what we sometimes can find is it leads to more questions. Mm -hmm. You know, like central sensitization. Ooh, what's that? And then you explain nociception, they go, oh, what's nociception? Mm -hmm. And then how do I know if it's nociception or if it's altered nociception? And then we don't actually have the answer to that in the research at the moment. Or then they can kind of ask, well, is it in my brain? Is it in my spinal cord? Is it things changing in my brain or changing in my spinal cord? And we also don't have really good evidence to say where exactly these changes are happening or what's causing what, chicken versus the egg. So it leads to a lot of problems and hard to communicate it. Another big problem with those words is it's hard for us to communicate it to them to help them understand. So for us to expect them to take it home and still know what we were talking about is very challenging. So this term was actually developed and identified by consumers, so people that had pain, and how they would describe what's going on in their body from what they've now learned about the neuroscience of pain. So it's kind of starting with the end in mind and going back. So, and when you think about it, pain system hypersensitivity, if you ask a patient, if you say to someone, look, we think from X, Y, Z, that what's going on is what we call pain system hypersensitivity. What does that mean to you? And what do you feel is going on? They're pretty likely to have a good idea of what's going on. This doesn't mean that we still don't take those steps to make sure they're open to what a challenging concept that may be for them. But once they're at that point where we're considering talking about central sensitization or nociplastic pain or peripheral sensitization, or even how mood and other factors totally unrelated to structural pathology are influencing their pain, this is where this may be more helpful to communicate it. And like what Lisa alluded to earlier, sometimes people label can be really helpful. It can give them this feeling like it's not me that's making this up, you know, gives them that identity or some cause for their pain, or even what they found in developing this term was the word system for these consumers was helpful for them to be able to distance themselves from they're not sensitive and they're not kind of non-specific or their back isn't non-specific. So it's able to be like, well, my pain system is becoming overly protective. And so what can I do to help with my pain system? So that's where that label's potentially going to be a little bit more helpful as well. <clears throat> and we know that from clinical terms and more the academic terminology, central sensitization, we all know what it does, but that's kind of a way to explain when there isn't clear nociception going on. And we also know that nociplastic contributing factors are becoming far more prevalent in these MSK conditions. And nociplastic is meant to be a clinical description of what's going on, but same thing when we try to explain nociplastic pain to them, questions arise of well, what's nociceptive and what's nociplastic, and it gets really confusing. But some of the key terminology and definition, I'm mindful we didn't touch on this last time. Does anyone want me to go through central sensitization or peripheral sensitization? We're all pretty familiar with it. So these are the IANSP definitions for it. Are you guys familiar with the phenotypes and the types of pain? Yeah, so I won't go through them. Basically, nociceptive pain, pain from altered nociception that isn't attributable to nociception or damage. So is there any value in determining it? So has anyone here got any, I suppose, experience or insights into trying to determine it and the clinical usefulness of it in the clinic? Go back one, show me. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, oh, it's just a bit delayed. There's a phenotype. Oh, 
Oh, we haven't gotten to it yet. Isn't that your phenotypes? Yeah. yeah. Your definitions. Yeah, so has anyone had... What was that? He, oh, he denies um, essentially sensitization. Yep. And um, most of the guys, and then the peripheral sensitization of the heat. Yep. Although I think the evidence is better for ice than, than heat. Yep. And so finding kind of that contributing factor to determine the intervention to deliver, what do you mean for identifying it? Identifying that yep. point discrimination. Yep. Sort of, you know, I guess some of my patients with public health um, with bladder interstitial cystitis, they yep. can be Hunter's lesions, which can be great from the nociceptive plus the sexualization, so it can be both. It can be yeah. quite complex. Mm. Um, where other um, bladder pain syndrome that don't have the Hunter's lesions, so it's more likely sexualization. So I think it's, I guess, some conditions can definitely have both, yep. and it's not lumping those patients in. Like you wouldn't expect someone with cancer to just breathe and you know and do yeah. the pain science and sort of going well checking to make sure that there isn't a something driving that nociceptive and pelvic floor overactivity can can drive it from a from a bio perspective. So. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. So sometimes it can be helpful to identify or to use strategies to identify it as well. And in terms of once we have identified it, what's the value of it? So See, these are some ways to try and identify it, some questionnaires that look at some of the different features that come up. Big overlap though, kind of what you alluded to, it's very challenging. And it's not that there's generally that's nociceptive or that's neuropathic or there is generally gonna be mixed presentations and what we're trying to understand is what's the predominant driver behind it. Is it things to do with central sensitization or is it nociceptive? Uh, non-neural or neural tissue because there's such an overlap so it's 196 features across them and there's only 37 unique features for no neuropathic 22 for nociceptive, and 17 for nociceptive so it's it's also the, the evidence isn't really strong to help us really nut out exactly what's going on so tools are still underway however there are there is some clinical application so these are some essential features so in nociceptive and most of you probably know this, so I'll go through it quickly, but it's mostly localised, preferred pain is possible, but it should be attributable to the, the cause of nociception. Neuropathic, it'll be in the dermatomes or myotomes if it's weakness. As opposed to nociplastic, it will just be spreading. It will seem to have no rhythm or method to the madness. Non-pain symptoms in nociceptive will be non-pain sensory symptoms are less common. Neuropathic, the standard neuropathic symptoms, and then nociplastic, they'll be showing up fatigue, cognitive sleep problems. In terms of testing, can't really test for nociplastic pain. Incidental findings may show up, but it's about working out, does that explain the amount of pain they're experiencing? And naturally for nociceptive and neuropathic, it's imaging to detect the damage. So what's the value in determining it? It does help us determine some interventions, either address the nociceptive cause or whatever factors are driving that amplification of pain, which may include psychologically informed therapy or involving like MDT, IDTT, or multimodal therapy as well. Also informs education. Makes sense that if they're presenting with nociceptive pain, we need to provide education around, well, there's a helpful protective purpose of that nociceptive information going on. So this was, this is a study that has a look at what some of the particular intervention types are that can be helpful. It may be disheartening to see that it says all pain phenotypes in the middle, but it, it does provide some distinction. So for mono or multi or interdisciplinary care, essentially they say if it's nociplastic or mixed or neuropathic, generally you're gonna need more of that multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach. We also know that interdisciplinary may be better than multidisciplinary and monodisciplinary may be better than multidisciplinary because there's can be mixed messages as well. Pain education, naturally we're addressing what's causing the pain, like I touched on earlier. Exercise, so if it's nociceptive, we need to be more respectful of the pain. It's got more of a protective purpose, promoting healing and inflammation may be helpful at that point in time, as opposed to neuropathic or nociceptive plastic or mixed, there's gonna be more of that 
well, how much pain can we tolerate using CBT approaches because we're not necessarily going to be causing more damage, but then coupling that in with graded exposure as well and graded activity if that's only the thing that's needed. Neurodynamic mobilization is naturally just for neuropathic pain and lifestyle interventions. So helpful for all of them, but mostly for nociplastic pain, mixed pain types as well. So is there value in identifying it? Yes. Do we need to use the, the testing in the clinic that's quite niche? It really depends. A lot of the time the subject of history can give you the information that you need from what they report of their signs and symptoms. But regardless of that, if, if you want more kind of clarity or conviction, unfortunately <laughs> there isn't a whole lot of conviction in the, the grading system. So this is what you could use. So you'll notice that how they score it is it's either possible nociplastic pain or probable. So even this grading system, it's, there's not a lot of definity and that's because it's still quite early days. But if you wanted to run your eye over it with patients to get a bit of an idea, this may be helpful. So how it goes is number one and four, if they're satisfied, it's possibly nociplastic. So that's basically pain more than three months, regional distribution, and it's not explained by damage in non-neural or neural tissue. And then number four, hypersensitivity due to static or dynamic mechanical allodynia or heat or cold allodynia, and kind of excessive pain or symptoms after testing for that. So that's possibly nociplastic pain if that's showing up. Now, if you want to see if it's probably nociplastic pain, you're looking at if there's other things going on like increased sensitivity to sound, light and odours, sleep disturbance, fatigue and cognitive problems, and a history of pain by sensitivity in the region of pain. So if you wanted a tool to be able to grade it, this is probably the best thing that you could utilise at the moment. So the bigger question... Sorry? Sorry? I was what was that one called? Oh, so that's the clinical criterion grading for nociplastic pain mm -hmm. by COSEC yeah, and CLAW. I can send through, yeah, yeah. but if you Google it, it'll, it'll come up. He's one of the, the pioneers at the moment. So why does pain persist? So we're going to have to quickly go into some pain neuroscience. What a shame. <laughs> <laughs> so you've all seen this before. We know acute is helpful at the start. Injury occurs, inflammation, pain goes up. As healing occurs, pain should drop because there's less need to protect. Unfortunately, it seems to persist. This is when it becomes less associated with the tissues and those neurobiological changes that we've spoken about. Sensors, they sit in the end of the sensor and neuron. They're basically letting positively charged ions go in. Once it hits the excitation threshold, the message goes up to the spinal cord. Once it's at the spinal cord, similar system, but chemical rather than electrical. If there's enough stimulus and receptor activity, it goes up to the brain. Then the brain evaluates it, all the information it has at that point in time, makes meaning of it, context, what's going on, what sensations am I experiencing, what emotions are showing up for me, what emotions should I show up with, determines all of this and helps the organism understand what's going to be the most protective thing at this point in time. And it's not necessarily going to be what's the most protective thing for that person's body. The reason I say that is we know that there's case cases of people that have torn muscles off bones to lift cars off kids and things like that. So at that point in time, the brain or that person's nervous system comes to the conclusion that protecting me isn't what's most important right now. So it can then utilise the descending pain modulation pathways to cause you to feel no pain when you would or should have pain in any other circumstance or context. So that's the, I suppose, the key distinction in how powerful the brain is in causing pain. But generally, when you're not having to save the life of somebody else, it's more likely to cause pain and inflammation at the site of injury or damage. And then peripheral sensitization and central sensitization often get a bit of a bad rap, but they are actually adaptive. They serve a helpful purpose at the start. So we want more inflammation to promote healing. And we also want to make sure that we don't keep walking on our fractured ankle. You know, so if it starts to get inflamed, we can get more hyperalgesic and even allodynic, perfect. Central sensitization, also helpful. Amplifies it, help us to protect it. And it's also involved in learning so that 
we can prevent having an injury like that again in the future. So it's when these persist naturally that it becomes a bit of a problem. So how these things persist is there's this release of chemical mediators that then creates that inflammatory soup. There's also when the nociceptors are activated, they actually release chemical mediators and inflammatory cytokines to contribute to even more pain and to promote healing. And there's also changes in the, the genes of the neurons so that they can be more responsive to information coming in. So all of this is going on so that nociceptive information is going to be sent from less stimuli in the environment, essentially. This then leads to that ongoing feedback loop of inflammation, sensitization, and activation of nociceptors and silent nociceptors as well. So what are the causes of it? Sometimes it's actually pathology that's going on. Alterations in nerve function, impaired healing, diabetic or smoking or other reasons, autoimmune factors, central sensitization can actually drive peripheral sensitization, ongoing stress and result in inflammation. So we know that when there's dysfunction in the HPA axis from ongoing stress, you're not getting those really helpful descending pain pathways. Think of drug cabinet in the brain from Noi Group. That all, yeah, you all have the drug cabinet in the brain. No. Oh, essentially, it's this kind of analogy they utilize to describe the, the areas of the brain involved in descending pain regulation. So the, the PAG and the RVM in the brain, they release like endorphins and kephalins. Um, uh, yeah, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, all of these chemicals can be released to basically turn down the pain protection system. So that you feel less pain, even though there may be damage going on, or in the instance of where there actually isn't any damage going on, but it's more of a nociplastic presentation, those descending pathways can modulate the pain in that respect as well. So they refer to it as a drug cabinet because endorphins are act on opioid receptors, so it's kind of like you're getting your own hit of opioids and medications that we use are in depression and mental health are having the same influences on serotonin and that type of thing. So it's a nice analogy that they use. Another reason is we see a lot of behaviours that occur from pain, particularly from when it's become peripherally sensitive. So then they're going to be guarding more and that may then persist beyond a helpful length of time, which then leads to other reasons those exception may come on like ischemic issues and that type of thing. So some of the neurobiological mechanisms of pain chronicity. So this is when we're talking about the brain and the spinal cord and things happening all through the entire nervous system, as opposed to central sensitization where it's just things that are going on in the spinal cord and how that's changing. And there's a lot of controversy in the academic world around what is considered central sensitization and what's not, because it's hard to work out what brain changes are causing things to change here and then the relationship between that and pain or whether or not it's purely changing things in the brain, if that makes sense. So if it's whether or not it's influencing nociceptive input and response. So long-term potentiation, probably pretty hard to read. Sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just a part of how we learn. It it's essentially means that the synapses get better at communicating with each other. And central sensitization is a big part of it. So all of these Factors are what contribute to the chronicity and functional connectivity changes in the brain. So we all know that when stimulus goes through that process and gets to the brain, the brain's evaluating the information it has at the time, sensory, emotional as well. So when we have a really emotionally traumatic event, which may be terrified or we're worried or whatever's going on, it's more likely to then activate other areas of the brain to give us that emotional response. When this is happening, it's then causing more, more likely for pain to persist because there's more threat value with the pain. There's more salience and there's more concern about what the risks are. So that's why we typically find that people with nociceptive pain or central sensitization, there's been some type of trauma, whether it's physical or emotional afterwards. And it's also why people that have a history of uh, adverse childhood experience and psychological trauma are more likely to have persistence of their pain as well, unfortunately. And 
dysfunction in the central pain pathway. So we know that the brain can modulate pain. It can cause us to have no pain. When it feels the pain, it's not going to be helpful. And the opposite of that. So a big problem with people with nociplastic pain and central sensitization is that that balance isn't working very well. So that drug tablet in the brain just isn't working very well. So people don't have the same systems that they would get if they say walk their dog or spend time with loved ones and that type of thing. And that means that the nervous system can't regulate pain as well. And that's a big part of it. And I don't always, well I never, sorry it's just a bit delayed, I don't go into that depth with patients well, some, but it's helpful to understand that there are these physiological changes that are going on. And when patients aren't necessarily buying into this concept of these changes, it can be helpful to talk about the physiological changes so that it's not just this, you're sad, your pain's worse. It's you're sad and then your, your body's doing this in a different way. And that's how it's changing your pain. <clears throat> oh, sorry, it's jumped. Yeah, so psychosocial mechanisms of pain criticity. So this ties in with the neurobiological. So you can utilize what we just spoke about to help them appreciate how psychosocial factors can contribute to it. But things like cognitive appraisal. So the information that we give them, if it's gonna to lead to catastrophization and rumination, that's then gonna activate more of those brain areas in that initial kind of response to the injury and the nociception that's going on, that's then more likely to cause that pain to assist as well. Not to mention, they're going to be more focused on it as well. The pain's going to potentially be the same intensity, but have a whole lot more interference in their life. Emotional response, so stress, anxiety, depression, like I've touched on before, the HPA axis can become dysregulated, so they're not getting the, the same benefits from things they engage in, and they're not getting that anti-inflammatory effect from the HPA axis as well. Behavioural responses, like I touched on, they're going to engage in less physical activity, so they're going to miss out on all of those benefits from physical activity, like endorphins, runner's high, sense of achievement, self-efficacy, confidence, all of those really good things for mood, and avoided behaviours. So how often do we see patients where they sniff as a board because they're terrified of work? And then that feeds into that kind of feeling of helplessness and hopelessness in terms of they can't do anything. And social factors. So the evidence around support is quite interesting. It's not surprising, but not enough support, obviously detrimental, you know, invalidated and they're just not feeling hurt. So they may try and boom bust to satisfy their partners or whoever it is around them or to prove themselves. If they have too much support, it's also a problem because then there's this kind of learned helplessness there's, they lose their identity, their self-worth, and so many other factors that come away with you're not doing the things you should be doing. And what I mean by that is the partner saying, oh, don't do that, I can do that for you. Mm -hmm. So they, they end up having nothing in their life other than the pain. At least they had some things that they were doing. And not only is it taking away opportunities for them to be more active and do more things for all of those benefits, it's also taking away from their relationship, like it's putting strain upon their relationship as well. And it's it's giving them more of a perception of threat. They're getting more information to suggest, well, they're saying I shouldn't do this because it's not safe for me. They may not say that explicitly, but that's what the patient may take away from it as well. And environmental, so workplace, we know that ergonomics is an interesting field. But we also know that ergonomics can definitely make a big impact on somebody's pain based on their tolerances to particular positions and that type of thing. And the psychosocial aspects of that, feeling perceived injustice, feeling like you're not being heard or listened to at the workplace, stigmatisation, all of these factors are then going to play into mood, mental health and pain. And unfortunately, healthcare provider interactions. So despite our best efforts, we can cause lots of psychosocial barriers to people's recovery. And like I mentioned earlier, it can be conflicting messages. It can be when we're invalidating what they're experiencing, host of different things. And it can make people feel like nobody can help me. This must be a really big problem. 
what's, what's next, hence Google. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so some of the predictors of altered central pain modulation. So it's a relatively new concept, central pain modulation. And I'm mindful it probably seems like there's 16,000 different phrases coming out in this space. This is just to encompass central sensitization and that ambiguity around what's central sensitization and what's things that are changing in the way the brain functions as well. So early identification may actually inform transition from acute to chronic pain. So there was a systematic review done on predictive factors, nine articles, and they found that at pre-morbid or acute stage baseline, high sensory sensitivity, so that's what you were referring to before, and psychological factors like somatization and poor self-expectation of recovery. So can we identify these? Yes, there's like quantitative sensory testing we can actually do in the clinic. So there's different ways of doing this. So it can be like using a tissue or like a monofilament to detect whether or not they're experiencing like a wind-up phenomenon where you keep doing it and the nociceptive barrage just keeps going so pain gets worse from repetitive taps, things like that, which is indicative of it. And the pain inside or It can be anywhere because that then it's giving you clarity on it. it's definitely nociceptive, but if it's more localised to the site of injury, it's more indicative of peripheral sensitization. Well, and it's hard to disentangle the two. Yeah, and all things like light brush, so either a tissue or like a little monofilament, things like that, hot and cold, so using an ice cube, or if you've got a coin, things like that. So all of those things in the grading criteria, a QST will, will test for that as well. And that's if, if you feel you've got the time to go through that. There are genetic testing, naturally, we're not gonna whip a genetic testing kit out of the clinic. Uh, and there is the ACR guidelines for tender point counts, which I'm not familiar with, uh, but that's something you could look into. Really easy to do screening questionnaires. It doesn't take much time out of the consultation, particularly if they're in the waiting room beforehand. Depends on how you want to present it to them. But as I mentioned before, these things may come up in the subjective. It's only if you're uncertain on their ability to report their symptoms and that type of thing that you may want to go down the path of quantitative. I don't use QST overly often, uh, uh, what are other people's experiences in testing for this in the clinic? I don't find it overly clinically useful compared to just a, a history taking and watching the way they move and the way they respond, uh, but it's certainly something that can be done as well. Predisposition, so sensory sensitivity, their coping styles, and like I mentioned before, generally there's a trigger for it. There's some injury or trauma, and that trauma doesn't have to be physical. It can be psychological trauma going on. The amount of times I've had patients that can't identify anything physically going on in their life when their pain started. But when you explore it further, there's some significant psychological trauma going on in their life. And trauma relatively to them, it is traumatic. Obviously there's really traumatic things that some people experience, but for that person it may be something like stress at work, much more than what they've ever experienced before, or it can be the death of a loved one or something so these are the most common assessments that are utilised in the literature for overall health. You probably can't read that from back here, but I can email it out. But it's just a list of some of the different tools that get utilised. So does anyone have an idea of the solution for people with central sensitisation and mostly plastic pain? <laughs> <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> That's not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> so BPS model, naturally. So we know that all of these things that are contributing to it are biopsychosocial factors. And, and like I mentioned earlier, it's really helpful for them to appreciate that there's biological changes going on in these pain states. And I think that that's where we've been missing the mark in the last few years. It's this patients are feeling like we're just saying it's psychosocial, but biologically things are changing because of the psychosocial. And I think that's something that is really helpful to communicate to them. So what do we think are the barriers to high quality MSK <coughs> pain care? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm joking. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just be expense. 
Sorry? Expense. Expense, yep. Expense, cost, time, wait lists, and scope of practice. You know, some GPs may not feel comfortable with certain presentations, or some physio GPs may not feel comfortable with pelvic pain and things like that as well. And funding models, workforce training limitations, health and organisational policies, social factors, and the skill knowledge of practitioners, their misconception or misinterpretation of the guidelines, and their... Time. Sorry? Time. Time, yes. And that's a big one for GPs, yeah. more than anything. Um, and that's number one for GPs, well and truly. And an understanding of the patient's factors as well. So we're all in this together. So we're not pointing fingers. <laughs> a systematic review, 94 studies in 19 countries. So they found 63% of physical therapists provide recommended care, which seems staggering. And the only reason it's physios is because there's a lot of research on physios. We're all as bad as each other, 57% of other health professionals. But this was in Australia in 2012. So I couldn't find anything more relevant for all of us other health professionals, but we're, we're doing some things wrong. I like to think though that we're the ones that aren't doing it wrong because we're <laughs> learning more. <laughs> but it's a big problem outside and in Australia. So this was something that kind of was a bit shocking to read, that physical therapists' use of recommended care has not changed since 1990s, yet use of treatments of unknown value appears to be increasing. So that's not probably, well it's not physios in this room, but it's a big problem. <laughs> And so that's kind of what I alluded to earlier with some of the treatments that there, there certainly can be a place for these modalities in some people's lives. It's I just think that some of the treatments that can be used have been thrown out, like throwing the baby out in the bathwater. Mm. Yeah. It's like mm. it is never no to all of these things. Mm. And sometimes they may be the one thing that you can get away with while you're reintroducing mm. movement mm. or um, that which is where it's challenging the guidelines because there's that element of therapeutic alliance in the ball. So if they're using these things to help them build a relationship and build trust, you can't disentangle it too. So that's a good... But there is good, the symptom management. If you, yeah. like, swelling is the classic thing. If you ignore the swelling, you're going to have more problems because of mm. unmanaged swelling. Mm. Don't ignore the swelling. Just yeah. because we need to do the education mm. as well. So, you know, but you, it's blending to do them both at the same time. You're all getting the whole time. Yeah. The whole consultation you're educating. Yeah, and even for, even for manual therapies where there isn't evidence to change pathology or healing mechanisms, there's still value in symptom modification to help them understand, hey, my pain changed and you didn't do anything. Initially, the narrative may be, oh, I just loosen that or move that back out of joint. Hopefully that's not the narrative, but if that's the narrative that they had, eventually you may be able to go, you know how you've kind of been really enjoying me putting your hip back in alignment, if that's a really fixed belief. Eventually, once you build rapport with them and you give them education, you can start to help them appreciate that, well, oh, I wasn't putting your hip back in alignment. Mm -hmm. And then they may be curious about, well, if you weren't putting it back in alignment, what was going on? So there's certainly a place for manual therapies and it's just using them in the appropriate way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it's also about how you explain it. Yes. Too. So I, I when someone with a lot of pain and having some of those yellow flag kinds of presentations, mm -hmm. I say I'm just putting some really safe input into your nervous system so the mm -hmm. brain can sort of go, oh, the touch is oh, safe okay. and feels mm -hmm. good, mm -hmm. rather than, so I never create pain in the pelvic floor work. Yeah. And it's, I think it's how you explain it. Mm. Rather than what did you say again? I'm, I'm, I'm just putting some nice safe input into your nervous system so the brain okay. can go, oh, that's okay, I feel that, and it's safe to let go. So, okay. um, yeah, I find, yeah, used well at benefit. Assessing on things that are like the idea of let's nurture the nervous uh, system, let's well. give it the input that it can handle so then we can do it wrong. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
okay, well, that might be safe to touch now, it might be a little bit of deeper pressure later, it might be use of vibration, it might be all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. That might sound a bit woo woo, but it's also saying, you know, thank you for protecting me mm -hmm. when I need it after that fracture. I don't need your protection anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be tied in with the neurobiological education mm -hmm. about it's kind of utilising those descending pain pathways physical touch, oxytocin. So there's, mm -hmm. and that's a whole other topic of mental therapy, uh, which I, I'm not an expert on. I don't even do it, but there is certainly a place for it, well and truly. And the narrative is the most important thing. But we may even come across people that have a narrative and they see you because they want that particular therapy and they have the narrative already. And if you try and challenge it, they're probably gonna go somewhere else. And in that instance, do manual therapy. Because if you don't do manual therapy, they're gonna go to somebody else that is gonna do the manual therapy and say, that's exactly what's going on and then keep getting that low evidence care. So yeah, with the guidelines, there's definitely nuance in the statistics as well. It was just such a shocking statistic to read. And, and there's also so many new things and technologies that come out. You know, We're always trying to innovate and create new ways to help people because that's what we want to do. And there's, you know, we can't create new interventions unless we try new things. So there needs to be a point where we try new things, but if something's working for somebody and it's anecdotal, there's no, not any evidence for it. If it works, we all need to know about it. So research should be done. They shouldn't just be doing it anecdotally, it should be getting communicated. And if it doesn't work, they need to know about it, which means we need to do research to prove that it is just anecdotal and that the reasons it's helping aren't actually because of the reasons that they communicate it's helping more or think it's helping if that makes sense so yeah and that's I suppose ties in with the belief that evidence is not relevant to practice there's evidence in full practice and we can certainly do interventions and things in the clinic that there is no research to say this works but based on what we know this might work and then if it does work and you keep doing it and it keeps working maybe you've got an idea for a PhD <laughs> so the research is then going to be, you know, looking at one, one treatment. One treatment is never going to be the yeah. answer. So yeah. this is a little point of the research says that's a useless thing to do because that's not the thing you do. You're doing about 15 different things over the course of treatment. It's yeah. not just getting stuck with one thing. So, yeah. Uh, I'm very understanding of the need for research, but I also know that some things are just in research in the way that can't actually in the way that actually use them. Mm -hmm. mm. Interesting. Yeah. And some of the other reasons, limitations of data and like these newfangled things that come through. So we know there's big gaps in imaging. What we know does work is audits and feedback, interestingly. So when people get guidance on, hey, consider this, they tend to follow evidence-based care. So that's helpful for us allied health professionals because we spend a lot more time with these patients. So we're more likely to hear about how they are experiencing domestic violence or other flags that could indicate, hang on, I'm pretty worried that this is gonna to transition to something much more than just acute and then healing. So we need to be able to communicate with GPs and go, hey, we're concerned about the client and transition of acute to chronic pain for X, Y, Z reasons as well. And reminder messages were helpful for GPs. What's, what, sorry, what's guideline dissemination? Oh, so sending it out. Sending? Guidelines to GPs. So that doesn't work, mm. apparently. So, GPs and then there is. guidelines all the time. Yeah. So, yeah, but what so does it work? Sorry? Do guidelines work? Oh. So what the research is saying in kind of public education campaigns to GPs that when they say here's the guidelines, it doesn't necessarily change their... Is that Australian? Yeah, that's Australia in GPs. Yeah, but I have something to challenge that coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I can I can have a look because I don't know exactly which guideline, but yeah. I can. I can no, send what's it your next one? What's your next? 
So the ones that do work is audits and feedback. Of what? Of the, the guideline-based care that the GP is delivering. So what they're saying is they give the guideline and if they just do that, it doesn't necessarily change the behaviours enough. If they then do audits on the GPs after giving the guidelines, perfect example might be like opioid prescriptions. So if they're saying, all right, stop prescribing opioids and there's no ramifications for it, then they're less likely to change. If you then... Sorry. Oh, the sticks, not the carrot. You're saying that they need the audit and the feedback. Oh, I'm not saying that. <laughs> 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 that's a working principle. You need repetition and you need reacquaintancing. Mm. It's not necessarily. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so what okay. may work are treatment algorithms, so things to give more clinic, clinical utility on how to follow the guidelines, because sometimes guidelines can be quite broad and they don't give you clinical application on how to do it. Uh, decision tools, modifying imaging reports to include simple terminology. What's that? Oh, so if you have someone scan a back and rather than it's saying something like mm. facet That's joint degeneration, it yeah, says yeah. normal age-related changes in the facet joint or something like that. That's what that kind of means. Okay. And explicit consideration of context of injury, okay. so which we all do anyway. But, oh, and this is specific to MSK imaging guidelines right. as well, not just okay. guidelines in general, yeah, in Australia. So that GP reminder messages, is that like telling them when they're doing too many shoulder ultrasounds? Isn't it? Don't you get So in this particular study for that one, it's to do with osteoporosis and when they're at risk of, I think it's osteopenia. So it's kind of going, hey, remember, you need to do this to help them out. That's what that one's in relation to. But that's a different study to the guidelines. You've quoted like 25 studies already. It's 41 in my end note. <laughs> yeah, I'll okay. get a few rabbit holes. <laughs> But there is a tool to support GPs in the matters of low back pain. So hopefully I can give you guys a tool. Um, so it's a fear reduction exercise early approach. I better fly through this. So I will fly through this. Basically, uh, lower back pain, any duration, most of them were less than six weeks, so pretty acute. Sinister pathology and back surgery was excluded during a standard consultation. So I can't remember the specifics in the paper, but they tested it. Well. There was other, they looked into maybe it's just the length wasn't enough, but they had a look at other similar things and two hours still didn't change it. Large focus was on simple exercise prescription. It didn't say what it was. And education and addressing psychosocial barriers to recovery. So the outcomes, no change in disability or pain, unfortunately. No adverse events besides one control participant. But GP attitudes, knowledge, and confidence in independent management improved. So they referred less to us, which is good because they're engaging with less health professionals. They don't need to see as many to get the same outcomes, essentially. So, and they also follow guidelines more closely as well. Uh, so less healthcare utilization, less time off work, lower costs and higher quality. And ultimately, it's less exposure to health professionals that every health professional they see is more risk of harm from us creating iatrogenic So what concerns. did the GPs do? The GPs gave them simple exercise? Simple exercise prescription and address psychosocial barriers. Like? Oh, it doesn't go into the details, but things like mood, mental health, could even be social factors like So hello, you, hello doctor, I've got back pain, how's your mood? What? The because you've got a time limit. Oh yeah, well I'm not sure the specifics. There's a risk factor in killing all the GPs. <laughs> yeah, but it's set up to a two hour consultation. So, no, they were able to do this in the standard consultation. 15 minutes. Well, this, this is in New Zealand and it didn't specify how long it was. I tried to find that out, but they didn't. So if anyone knows how long NZ GP consultations are, <laughs> let me know. Uh, but yeah, they were getting it done and that's the amazing part about it. GPs in the very limited time they have are able to have the same outcome as uh, the control group. Uh, no, sorry, they're able to get not 
they're not getting better disability or pain, but all those other outcomes. So they're not. So they're so not needing more care yeah, for the so same. Yeah, reducing the demand on the healthcare system. Pretty much. Simply yeah. offering them exercises and addressing their psychosocial. The barriers. barriers or factors or things that are going on. Okay. I've got a few more slides. It's 6.31. So this is it. Ironically, it's the free approach that you can't get it freely online. It hasn't come out yet, um, but if anyone's interested in it. So what led to the outcomes? Guideline-based care. They applied the BPS model, basically. How else was it beneficial? This is my own interpretation of it. So, and I'll just talk through it. <laughs> Attitudes relate to their own responsibility and recovery. So those people, when they have an injury again in the future or a flare up of back pain, they're much more likely to think, I need to do some exercise or I need to think about psychosocial factors as opposed to medication. So that's a really big outcome from that as far as I'm concerned. That's not in the literature. So, in, so these people with acute lower back Yes, they didn't months. have surgery within six months. Oh, less than six weeks of back pain? Uh, it was any lower back pain, but 88% of them was less, less than, than six, six weeks. weeks. So yeah. it was predominantly so acute. Back pain. Yeah, and they didn't, they hadn't had surgery, and obviously it wasn't significant, sinister pathology. Yeah. So if time or scope is a barrier for the GPs, because I know that's a big concern, right? Triaging the physios is just as effective. It's not any more beneficial but it's not detrimental. And that's without medications. And we know that medications are really helpful. In so, so the trick is going. not to prescribe the medication and do the physio referral. The is just, just do the physio referral and hold back on that. Potentially, if wow. the GPs don't have time or they're not interested in going through the free approach as well. Yeah, it's essentially. It's really hard when you've got really, really severe pain and you can't sleep or do anything mm. in the day to leave the GP with no pain medication. Yeah, well that's that's what that's saying, so that they didn't use the GP, like it was the same as with GPs without being able to prescribe pain medication, which is huge. Because, like, in very, very basic pain medication, not, not obviously, mm. um, they just didn't have the medication. Yes, yeah, so, so... It's not a matter of no medication, it might be that you encourage them to test and panel. Mm. Well, truly, and that was kind of picking one of two when you should have both. So this is one of the last slides, I'll try and fly through it, but this will kind of address that as well. So pain generator, recurrent pain. So this is to kind of highlight that there's adaptive and maladaptive things going on. So if it's adaptive, inhibitory modulation occurs. They actually have an adequate response to traditional analgesics, you know, and they're getting prescribed, but they should be prescribed. We know that you sh inadequate pain relief in acute pain is a big problem. So if physios are able to have the same outcome as GPs without that, why not both? You know, and then we can have a much better outcome. So when they have genetic factors at play, inadequate analgesia, and a delay in diagnosis and treatment, that's when all of the maladaptive stuff happens. And there's like a poor response to the traditional analgesics, which the mechanism of them is then not due to no exception. There's other factors. So how to prevent it? Early intervention within days to weeks. Adequate analgesia, multimodal, needs to consider psychosocial factors and interventions and potentially IDT, FDT team or multimodal therapy. You know, if there's an EP or physio that's trained in psychologically informed therapy, maybe they don't need to see a psychologist as well and then it's all in one room. So that's probably not overly relevant. Resources I can email out, some of the researchers to follow. Any questions? Oh, well done. <laughs> Thank you.